Hi guys, I'm Dr Ingrid Visser with the Orca Research Trust and with Whale Rescue and obviously we're down here with Toa, the little male orca uh, who was stuck in a rock pool on Sunday. Um, he's just taking a little bit of a rest at the moment. Looks like he's almost having a nap but he's going around from person to person He's really liking that social contact because, of course, he got separated from his mum. And the big thing is when, when they're separated at this age, you know, they get social anxiety because, because they don't have that social context. So we just can't say thank you enough to everybody in the community here for everything that they've been doing. There's just been so many people that have helped. It's, a, it's almost embarrassing. Um, but you guys are absolute rock stars. Thank you. How's Toa doing? So he's doing really, really well at the moment. You know, he's quite quiet, but that's not unusual at night. I mean, they do travel all the time. They travel at night. Um, but <laughs> he's still alert. You know, we can really see that his eyes are watching us when we're down there with him. And uh, he's really engaged with people. We've been doing a little bit of whale yoga with him as well, so making sure that he's doing all his stretches and that he doesn't get cramps. And what's the what's the purpose of, of what what we see here? Having the people in with Toa and kind of interacting with him like this. So at the moment, we're making sure that he doesn't go around the edges of the uh, pen and that he doesn't hurt himself on the edges. So the people are there for a couple of different reasons. One is that he doesn't bang up against things, but the other one is just for that social context. And. Uh, He's becoming really familiar with us, which is great as well, because when we have to feed him, we don't want him to get that anxiety of being captured. We just want him to come to us, and then we can guide him in quietly into the shallows. We've been putting a tube down his throat and then giving him electrolytes with it in a warm liquid so that we can keep his body core temperature at what it should be. And uh, the first time that we gave him some of that, he got really excited and he was squeaking away. Um, but he's been really, really calm this evening, which is great to see. I know some people have expressed some concern that, um, you know, it's a little bit like picking up a, a baby bird and, you know, their mum won't, won't interact with them again after that. You know, what's the story with that and, and to it becoming imprinted on the people? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of people have concerns about the potential for imprinting, but it's really important to remember from a biology point of view, animals only imprint on a different species or their own species I'm in a very restricted time span. So for chickens, it's just the first few hours after they're born. For orca, it's the first couple of days. Because he's somewhere between four to six months of age, there's no way that he can imprint on us. So he doesn't think of us as his mum. Um, even if he comes to expect food from us, that's a completely different thing. So he can become familiar with humans, he can become habituated, but he's not imprinted on us. He still knows that he's an orca, and if we get him back with his family, he will return to his mum. And so what is the goal? What are we hoping is going to happen next? So we're really hopeful that someone out there is going to spot his family that we can get out there, check that it's his family, and then we're going to try and relocate him there. Whether we do that by boat or whether we do that overland, that's going to depend on where the animals are and what time of the day it is and what the weather is. Um, but now that we're able to give him some electrolytes and tomorrow we're going to give him some milk formula, um, that opens up the window for us to be able to do this safely for him. Did I understand earlier when you'd had a little go with a little bit of milk formula tonight and that had been the first time? No, so no milk formula tonight, but tonight we tried for the first time using a teat to get him to suckle. And that's really important because then we don't have to bring him into the shallows to feed him. And we can feed him when he's out in the deeper water, which is obviously a much more natural position for him to feed. How, how do you feed an orca? <laughs> so uh, normally you would not feed an orca, just so that we get that clear. Uh, you don't feed them when they're adults either. And um, But in his case, we use a tube that we pass down through um, the esophagus and into his stomach. And um, it's just liquid that we put in and we just pour it into the funnel and it goes down the tube. But if we can get him to suckle from the bottle, then it's just like feeding a lamb or, or a calf or any of those animals that we would feed when we're bottle feeding them. Hey everyone who can hear me, if uh, anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, please just feel free to type them in. I can see them on the screen and I'll, I'll ask Ingrid for you. So what's... Um, are we relying on... on um, 
on Tor's pod to, to arrive here, do you think? Or what would, what would happen look, if they turned up somewhere else? Yes, yeah, so look, potentially his pod could come back. Uh, we do know some, from some photos that were taken on the day that he got stuck in the rock pool on Sunday, uh, we, we do know two of the animals that he was travelling with. Now, those two individuals have been photographed as far north as the Bay of Islands and as far south as Kaikoura. Uh, so they could be anywhere in between at the moment. Uh, and obviously each day the potential for them to have travelled further increases. We know that New Zealand orca travel between 100 to 150 kilometres a day. So every day it's getting further and further away. But the thing to remember is that orca aren't on train tracks. You know, they don't have to go in one direction. They can turn around and come back and they could turn up back here again too. Maybe a sad question. What happens if we can't find Toa's pod? So if we can't find his pod, uh, there is a number of different contingencies that we're looking at. Potentially, um, we have to keep in mind that there's also um, the option for surrogate mother mothering. So basically what happens there is that another female who has a calf with her could basically just scoop him up and keep her with him and would give him milk as well. And then when his group meets up with that group, um, then he would transfer across to his mum. And we do know that that's happened with Orca in the wild in British Columbia before. How long do we have to find um, his pod, do you think? Well, you know, that really depends on a number of different scenarios. Uh, it depends on, for example, um, how well he takes to the formula and, uh, you know, what are the weather conditions and, um, and, and also watching him floating there. I'm as fascinated with him as, as you guys are. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, the scenario really is based on um, his well-being and his health. And so that's something that we're going to continue to monitor. We've got a suite of vets. Uh, I think there's something like 30 vets that are all in consultation for him at the moment uh, at an international level. And so... We're keeping the door open on the longevity of, of how long we've got at this stage. This is cruel for Toa. What do you think? Is it cruel? Hmm. No. I think it would be really, really cruel if we left him out there alone and starving. And then, you know, potentially he could be attacked by a shark. He could wash up on the rocks and get really, really badly hurt. He could wash up on a beach and the seagulls could peck his eyes out. We've seen these scenarios before with little animals that are left alone. Um, so at the moment, this is the best option for him. And trust me, we really have his best interests at heart and we're doing everything that we possibly can to help him. Someone's asked, what's an orca formula? Well, what do you think? <laughs> an orca formula, well, it's got all sorts of things in it. Uh, it's got fish oil in it and it's got a little bit of milk powder from goats usually because they don't like um, the lactose from cows. And it's got vitamins and minerals and calcium is another thing that's in there and I'm trying to think of them all there's so much stuff that's in it um, but it is a formula that it has been put together over about 30 years of experience of dealing with little orca that have lost their mums in one way or another How long before an orca Toa's size? How, how old is Toa by the way? Oh, right? So Toa is somewhere between 4 to 6 months of age and he's just over 2 metres long and how old would he need to be before he's eating something other than, than, than milk? Oh, so he would probably be taking solids at the moment as well as milk. Um, and in fact, at the time that he got washed into the rock pool, he was right beside his mum who was hunting for rays. Uh, so I've got records of a young orca who was actually in Whangarei Harbour today. Her name is Pickle. And um, when she was one year old, she was already capturing rays for herself and eating them. And that's a pretty impressive feat when you consider that uh, rays are really dangerous prey to hunt. Uh, but he potentially at nine months, he could be three quarters weaned uh, at a year old, fully weaned. Um, and again, it depends on the individuals. So there are some scenarios where they're younger that they get weaned and some scenarios where they're older, just like humans. So what's it like? I mean, you've, you've obviously been to many similar events around the country for a, for a long time, is that right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I've been doing this for a wee while now, about 30 years, and uh, rescued, gosh, I'm not quite sure how many orca. Uh, 
10 or more, I guess. Uh, and then been involved with scenarios overseas as well, helping out there. And, you know, some of them are really, really successful and some of them are not. And, uh, you know, often the ones that are not is because we don't get to the animal soon enough. So the remarkable thing with him was that somebody actually saw it happening. And because of that, we know the scenario and we were able to respond almost immediately. And that gives us a huge advantage towards helping him. Your own response was extraordinary. You weren't just down the road, were you? <laughs> no, no. Um, I live at Tutukaka near Whangarei, uh, which is up sort of halfway between Whangarei and the Bay of Islands. And uh, I had an hour to get ready before I had to rush off to catch the last flight out of Whangarei that would get me here uh, that night. So I was down here on Sunday night. And who's, who's here Who's here involved with you? Who's, who's doing this work? Oh, so we've got a huge team. Uh, we've had over... 200 volunteers come through so far that have been in the water helping him um, and each one of them is spending at least an hour in the water and uh, we've got a plethora of NGOs and support such as the fire guys and um, the city council and the NGOs for animal welfare like Hoo-Ha and EVAC, uh, Animal EVAC and uh, Maritime Police, Coast Guard, and where does it stop? It's just so many people. And then we've had such incredible help from the community. Food, like yummy, yummy, yummy food. I had an amazing um, meal this evening, which was Thai food from, what's it? Tik Tuk Tuk. Tuk Tuk. Tuk Tuk. Oh, you guys are amazing. And, <laughs> and we had Hell's Pizza, and we've had... Uh, Bunnings has been down here with lovely warm gloves and socks and we've had people donating heaters and blankets and honestly it's just amazing and I cannot say thank you enough and I apologise if I didn't call out your name to say thank you. How does this compare to the typical sort of whale streaming? Oh look, you know, there is no such thing as a typical whale event. Mm. Um, every one of them is a different scenario and you have to just have a completely open mind on how you're going to deal with this. I suppose final question, do you, what, what kind of help could people in the community offer that would be that would be of value now, do you think? So we're really asking everybody to still keep sharing on social media that we're desperately looking for his family. And um, we're also asking for people to uh, support each other because you know this is a traumatic time for many people there's lots of people that are coming down here and spending hours and hours and hours helping out and then they rely on other people to help so we've got for example um, some people that have been down here since he first stranded and they've got four dogs um, that someone else is helping look after and we've got uh, hoo-ha with all of their animals that they've rescued and they've got had to call on extra people to come and help them so you know, that, that sort of community level is spreading further and further. Is there anything I haven't asked you'd like to say to the people of Plymouth? Oh, look, there's so many things I could say, but, um, you know, I, I strongly recommend you come down and see him if you can. Um, we'd love to get you to meet him in person and see a little bit about him. Thank you. And thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah.